Columbus, Ohio at the headquarters of Prevention Action Alliance. I um, hope you are off to a great start this week. My name is Brittany Sandage and I'm the Director of Coalition Programs. I'll be hosting and answering any of your questions, fielding any technical concerns today. And with me, of course, is our Executive Director, Marcy Seidel, who's going to share some legislative alerts from here in the home state and some of the things that were coming um, that are coming to the forefront of conversation right now. Um, for those of you who are just returning from home, welcome back from CADCA, if you were a part of that. Um, I had the pleasure of being in Washington last week with um, a very, very impressive delegation of Ohioans. Um, at our state territory meeting on Tuesday, um, we had 82 folks show up, um, really participate in planning for their legislative visits. Um, we had a total of 16 visits during Capitol Hill Day, and a chance to really just bring out um, some good uniform messaging. To sort of share with um, the larger audience some of the key concerns that came up in our conversation during that state territory meeting, um, we really discussed uh, three primary um, concerns or, or interest areas. One, in making sure that we're continuing to promote the achievements and the roles that coalitions have, that community-based prevention has, um, especially here in Ohio where we have such a rich history of coalition work and some incredible outcomes from various groups across the state. Um, we talked about the, the need to not only protect that funding, but in the case where we are today and with what the nation is facing, trying with everything we can to promote and increase that level of community-based funding. A second concern that came up over our conversations and that we shared with legislators um, was the need for a good continual um, communication system. Um, with some of the changes that have faced NREP and with how we're going to be able to search out evidence-based practices and programs, there was a lot of conversation about what can we do. Uh, we were fortunate to have um, Molly Stone with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services attend the meeting, and she was able to share that the department will be promoting um, the SAMHSA-based criteria, and we will make sure that we share that information out in our e-blast and also invite you to submit any questions so that we can pass those on. But it is encouraging to know that the state of Ohio is taking those steps and making sure that we have um, some guidance on where to go forward in the absence of um, some of the ongoing support at a national level for that, for that registry. And then one of the last things that we talked about um, was really striving and fighting for primary prevention and using an argument um, around the children who've been impacted by especially the opiate crisis. You know, it came up across the room um, that we are continuing to see not only an increasing number of children whose direct parents or grandparents are, are being impacted by active addiction, but also just the changes to the social network of these children who are seeing um, who are seeing family dynamics shift around them, who are getting messages or not getting messages of any kind um, that, that enhance their protective factors. And so we talked quite a bit about making sure that we bring that up in our conversations at a local level, at a state level, at a federal level, driving home that primary prevention is truly one of the best possible ways um, that we can ensure that a future generation is gonna have the protective factors it needs to, to thrive and to succeed. So those are some of the thoughts and the takeaways from our state territory meeting. Um, we did have a chance to hear from the new assistant secretary um, for mental health and substance abuse at SAMHSA, Dr. Eleanor McCants Katz. Um, one really uh, encouraging point that she made was was her dedication to making sure that the use of marijuana is appropriately researched, that it is not um, billed as a cure-all or an overly safe compound in our communities. Um, she had a very strong position on that, and it was very encouraging to hear that coming from our leadership at the federal level. Um, we also heard a little bit from her on some of the different roles that um, prevention specialists can play in the in the work to, to really address the opiate crisis. And a lot of her comments focused a little bit more heavily on creating um, on-ramps to treatment and making sure that we're helping to raise awareness and address stigma. I know that coalitions across the state of Ohio are already very much engaged in those efforts. Um, and I think it's, this is an opportunity after hearing some of those comments to also do some more education locally 
um, and at the higher levels on what else coalitions can do. I think there's still a lot that we can help to share and educate our fellow um, practitioners and professionals about in terms of the role that we play. So that was, it was a really good and eye-opening um, conversation to be able to be a part of. Um, we also had a chance to hear from the um, Office of National Drug Control Policy. I won't share those thoughts because as of the news um, that was shared on February 8th, there might be some additional changes coming to the leadership of that office. So stay tuned. We will certainly um, share information as we discover it. Um, but it's a time of change right now in Washington. So it was interesting to be there. Great to be there with so many amazing people and a big congratulations to those who were able um, to bring their youth and to have them speak so beautifully. It was it was a good week. So um, that is my quick update from our time in DC. And without any further ado, I'll turn this over to Marcy Seidel. Just as a quick reminder, if you have questions, please make sure that you um, submit them to me. We will address them throughout the call and towards the end if we need to. Marcy, over to you. Well, good morning, fellow Ohio advocates. It's uh, a delight to be with you on this beautiful February morning. We have uh, lots of things sort of brewing here in the state of Ohio and nationally, so it's it's interesting to try to keep pace with all that's going on. As as Brittany said, we had, I think we were in one spot, especially at the federal level, and only to find out that things are moving again in another direction. So we're going to do our best to keep up with those things and communicate them with you as as we know them. Uh, if you are not receiving the weekly legislative update, please sign up to do that. That's a good opportunity to, to stay abreast of what's happening. And also, we welcome your feedback on that, so how we can be more um, able to help you in your, in your work and in your advocacy and to understand what's happening in the environment around us. So please feel free to, to give us some feedback on that. Um, the first thing that, that we want to talk about is just basically the, the House of Representatives and the Senate in the state of Ohio uh, continue to work, and my understanding is that they will be in session through the month of April. And then once April hits, we have what's called the midterm elections coming up, where there'll be a lot of uh, time to go out and, and do some campaigning and uh, working on the election sort of piece. And so the legislature is going to slow down at that point. But I think there's also an opportunity for us at that point to look for those legislators that are running for office, especially those in the um, gubernatorial election, to look at what we need to do to, to help them as well. So just know that, that we've got a robust uh, time period for the next couple of months, and then it'll slow down um, legislatively in the state of Ohio. The Ohio Medical Marijuana Control Program, just an update on that. Uh, as you all know, again, it's House Bill 523 that was passed, and it is due to be fully implemented uh, by September 8th of this year. Uh, their dispensary sites at this point have not been selected, but they are in the process of uh, going through those applications to make sure that the uh, right number, which is 60, will be distributed fairly evenly around the state of Ohio. We also learned we had a, a medical marijuana advisory committee on um, last Thursday, and we learned at that time that there are approximately 250 physicians in the state of Ohio who have shown interest in perhaps prescribing marijuana. So that's an interesting um, statistic to us. We know that there's a lot of a lot of physicians that are, and their um, the hospitals and the uh, health groups that they work with that are a little bit shy about joining in on this endeavor, but um, it is moving forward and we'll see how it will play out. Um, as I said, the 60 dispensaries is uh, not uh, complete at this point, but they're certainly working through that process uh, to come up with them. We have 70, uh, when we come to cultivators, we have 70 of the uh, cultivators that supplied applications to become a growing unit in the state of Ohio that are actually appealing the decision of the fact that they have not been selected. This is an interesting process and there is something in the Ohio Revised Code that's an administrative code that will allow that process to go through on a standard process. So there will be 70 different hearings listening to 70 different reasons why they believe that the, fair, the process was unfair to them individually. And that will not, however, slow down the process of moving forward the 24 that have been selected to get their sites up and running. But it is part of what 
I know that the um, the marijuana the marijuana program anticipated, and so it's not anything out of the, the norm of what they've expected, and we'll be moving forward. Uh, there have been nine testing laboratory applications that have been received. Those are important things to have because they will tell us exactly what's in the marijuana. They will be able to monitor uh, fertilizers, pesticides, any other sort of thing that will uh, be a contaminant to the product. And so it's important that we know what's in them. There will be no limit to the number of testing sites that will be allowed and licensed in the state of Ohio. But at this time, there are only nine. Some of them are uh, private institutions and some of them are public as well. So as the time goes on, we hope that that will increase as, uh, as we anticipate the, the demand for this product will increase as well. A company has been awarded to create a managed and manage the toll-free hotline that will be put into place when this program is up and running. This hotline is for basically for anybody and certainly most specifically for patients who have concerns about the adverse effects of marijuana or have questions about marijuana. And during the meeting on Thursday, we advocated for the fact that this hotline be used to help us collect information about marijuana, since we have very little research and we know very little about what to expect, that this kind of a hotline can help us gather some of the data and the information that we need as we move forward with this um, process of medical marijuana in Ohio. Uh, also, in mid-March, we will find out, we have found out that the applications for doctors who are wishing to uh, to subscribe this, or prescribe this rather, will be available. So they will be, uh, uh, doctors will be submitting those applications. And with all of that said, from the cultivators to processors to dispensaries to doctors to patients, all of those things are being put into motion right now. And within the next two to three months, we'll come together for fine tuning to, to make this all be a possibility on September 8th. One of the uh, House bills that, and Senate bills that have come up is House Bill 495 and Senate Bill 254. Both were introduced this week and they're called concurrent bills and that they're basically the very same bill. And when the Senate and the House come together to put a bill on at the very same time, it means they really want to fast track it. So that the, the Senate will be having hearings at the same time that the House will be having hearings. And then when the two bills come together, it'll be in a concurrent session to work out any differences that they might have. And basically what this bill is, is related to, to marijuana in that it will uh, provide a closed loop payment processing system uh, for the medical marijuana control program. A closed loop card means it's, a, it's like a debit card will be created. It's authorized by the Department of Commerce to fil facilitate transactions in basically a closed loop payment process. It'll be a cashless system and it um, will be monitored and facilitated that, that financial tra transactions that relate very specifically to medical marijuana and all aspects of it. So it will be to caregivers, to patients, to the um, employees, their paychecks, independent contractors, the seller of goods, the services, anything that has to do with that. As you all know, it is illegal federally. Therefore, uh, the banking system and the, the standard financial institutions don't want any part of it. So this is Ohio's way of uh, handling these problems where there won't be cash, so much of a cash basis. Um, it has been indicated in the uh, actual bill as it was introduced that the Director of Commerce shall, and the word shall means they will do it, as opposed to may, which means that they have the option to or not to. So when the word shall is used in the revised code, it means that this bill will require the Commerce, uh, the Director of Commerce to do it. And um, they will set up this system uh, and a medical marijuana entity or a patient uh, will be able to establish an account under this system. It will require that the entity deposit money other than money directly generated from the sale of marijuana uh, 
or from this state or another state to generate to put money into that account and then they will use the money in that account to provide the transactions that they need to do to fulfill what's going on. There's a lot of uh, analysis that needs to be done around this. There's a lot of people that hail this as a really revolutionary process of doing things and others that say this is a disaster waiting to happen. I will um, not put any editorial comment on this until we do a little bit more of a research to find out what's involved, but uh, we will be watching this bill very closely because, as I said, they will be fast-tracking it. That, as far as bills, is about the only thing that's happened much since we've, we've last uh, communicated, uh, other than what's going on for several bureau of bills and the hearings uh, in the uh, legislature, but I, I will direct you to the weekly updates to stay track of those. We did also come out this week, the CDC just came out with the fact, and I believe it was yesterday, that Ohio overdose death rates have uh, started to, are climbing again, or continue to climb, or remain climbing. 5,200, over 5,200 drug overdose deaths in the last 12 months have happened in Ohio, and that's a period ending on July 2017. That's an increase of 39%, which is uh, frightening. Only Pennsylvania and Florida have had more, but that's not something that we should uh, feel good about. We need to continue to work very hard on this. The uh, fentanyl piece of it is a strong component to these overdose, and we're finding fentanyl and also cocaine playing into the overdose deaths, not just prescription drugs and heroin. So that the problem remains complex. Ohio's ability to respond to this problem needs to be more robust. We need to have it across the continuum of care, not only in our primary prevention more robust, but intervention treatment and certainly in the recovery to help those that have made it through and support them in their, their recovery process. So uh, we will continue to advocate strongly, certainly across the continuum of care to make sure this happens. We also learned this week that Purdue Pharma, who is the manufacturer of OxyContin, will stop direct marketing to doctors on this. Uh, that's sort of their piece at this point to try to make to make amends for what's been going on with this particular drug and the, and the toll that it has taken. Um, but as we saw the Attorney General say, this might be a little bit too late for what's happening. But again, uh, they've laid off a number of people that are salespeople and will not be doing that. So we will continue to watch how the pharmaceutical companies are addressing this crisis. The um, Next thing that I just want to talk about, and I touched on it a little bit prior to this, was that uh, the gubernator, gubernatorial candidates are really starting to put together their policies and their platforms as they run for, for governor. And this is a unique time for all of us to reach out to those individuals to find out what their policies are and questions that we would ask if you have an opportunity to go to a forum or a debate or a town hall meeting where any of them are, we encourage you to think about questions, uh, certainly not only as they relate to your uh, communities, but also to the uh, statewide level as well. And that is, we'd like to know where they stand on full legalization of marijuana. One of our staff people here went to a, um, a town hall meeting with some candidates, Democratic candidates for the gubernatorial um, campaign, and heard very clearly that almost all of them are in favor of full legalization of marijuana. They, however, indicated that they would prefer that it be by citizens' um, request, which means a ballot initiative, so that it comes from the citizens and not from from the, the government. government. My concern with that and my concern with anyone who proposes that is that we know that these processes are very complex. Sitting on the Medical Marijuana Advisory Commission and watching the process that they have gone through and the rules and the regulations and, and the safeguards for both patients, for the, the citizens as a whole, is, is intense in detail and complicated. And you cannot write and you cannot put legislation like that into a ballot. 
It simply cannot be done. So uh, whatever the situation is, we believe it should be done at a leg legislative forum where it can be de de debated and it can be in a process that can be changed easily. So take a look at those things and see whatever the candidate is that you are interested in, and in fact, all of them, that you understand what their policy is, and it might not hurt to help educate them about the difficulties that can happen. We also want our candidates to understand what prevention is, and the majority of them do not have an understanding at all. In fact, if I even were to ask my husband what prevention is, he might not be able to come up with a great explanation as well. So it's incumbent upon us to make sure that our policy and our leaders in our state know what prevention is, and then to ask them the question as to what the priority of prevention will be in their administration. Nothing about that could be more important, because if we don't get ahead of the problems that we're facing now, we'll be in catch-up mode for the rest of our lives, and certainly in the rest of their administrations as they try to move forward. We'd rather save lives, prevent this from happening, than have to be in the recovery, treatment, and cleanup mode. Marthy, thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions rolling in, um, and just for those who are still um, typing away, um, please just keep things rolling in. We'll answer them as long as we have the time for it. Um, Marcy, first question, we have it from Evie, is curious about what type of data they hope to collect through the hotline that you mentioned connected to marijuana through the commission. Well, it's, I thank you for that question. Um, that was part of our concern at the meeting was um, we're not 100% sure that they even know what kind of data they want to collect, and that's part of my uh, our process as an advisory committee. There were many of us on the advisory committee that were pushing to try to get this um, data collected. So anything that any of you feel like is an important thing that we might be able to collect, please email that to me, and we will continue to advocate for that. I think one of the things that they – are looking at is what type of products, how they affect the condition that the individual has, and is as effective or not. So that's not a, a scientific gathering of information, but it is a, a, an information that gives us some groundwork to look at research that needs to be done to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the patient. Thank you, Marcy. We did have a clarification question come in. Um, a a couple of folks are actually wondering, related to the opioid um, overdoses in particular, is Ohio still considered number one, or are we waiting on some of those numbers to be clarified at this point? It, I think it sort of depends on who it is. I know it's the CDC that came through with this information, indicating that in the last 12 months, from July of 16 to July of 17, the number of overdose deaths that we had in the state of Ohio was below that of Pennsylvania and that of Florida. So they were higher uh, drug overdoses than, than what we had. So uh, however one looks at it and whatever the, the position comes in, we, have, we really were number three as far as the actual numbers, so according to the CDC. Thank you, Marcy. Um, I have a question coming in um, from Devin um, up in the northern area of Ohio. Is Purdue Pharma the only pharmaceutical company that you are aware that is attempting to do something around the opiate problem? Um, and I know I can speak for myself that we've heard of a few um, different companies and different foundation arms of pharmaceutical family companies um, that are investing in um, digital education, that are investing in some of the um, prescription disposal programs, but Marcy, maybe you have some additional thoughts to that. Um, we certainly know that, that Cardinal has, has stepped in to do that, um, as well as Amerisource Bergen is stepping in to do certain things. Uh, individual companies, I'm not very much aware of, but I know the, the kind of the foundations and the, the trade groups that involve many of the pharmaceutical companies are really trying to step up and do, do a variety of things. And I think it's uh, certainly it's, it's showing itself up right now, and I'm not saying it's only because of that. I think they're understanding the magnitude of this problem. But as different states uh, threaten 
the lawsuits that are coming out, I think they're all looking to do things to make sure that they are recognized as good corporate citizens. In many cases, pharmaceutical companies I know of are trying to do things that don't sell even opiates. That's not their brand and that's not what their their market is, but they too feel a responsibility to help out in this crisis. So I know that they're happening to do that and uh, we're encouraging you know that to happen. Thank you very much, Marcy, and, and thank you to everyone who um, is currently sending in some questions. Uh, I wanted to, as some things are rolling in, just offer a little bit of encouragement um, for those of you who were participating at CADCA last week and did attend a Capitol Hill visit. Um, remember that that relationship at a federal level and at the local offices of those elected leaders and here at the state, it's an ongoing relationship. Keeping in contact with those offices is critical. Um, it takes a few times to remember our faces, um, and and so making sure that we are out there, we're we're answering the call for help at the same time that we're raising the alarm on local needs that we have is critical. So if you have opportunities to keep to forge those relationships with the local offices, if you have the ability to invite those elected leaders um, to events that you're having in the summer when they may have time to do that and they can get um, sort of in front of whatever coalition work you're doing, remember to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, it can be really hard to do the work that we do, um, but showcasing the power behind the group work that's happening at your level is very, very persuasive and very powerful. Um, so I just wanna encourage folks to make sure you send your thank yous, make sure you stay in contact. Um, you know, they're, they're powerful humans, but they're still humans. So we have to remember that and, and stay connected to them as best we can. Um, we're currently wrapping up on our time here. Um, Marcy, did you have anything that you wanted to say or particularly maybe about the GAP Summit before we go? Oh, yes. The GAP Summit is coming up this um, Friday and Saturday. And if you are registered or if you have uh, someone in your community that's that's coming, we are we're we're waiting and looking forward to to you being there. We think it's going to be a wonderful opportunity to, for individuals to come in to uh, learn more, uh, figure out how their advocacy can be put to the best use, and also to help those that are in a grieving process come together and, and know that they're not alone. So we are really very much looking forward to that happening this uh, Friday and Saturday. There's more information on our website if you'd like to, to find about it, preventionactionalliance.org. And I just want to close by saying that it's so exciting and heartening to see the advocacy piece growing in the state of Ohio at the rate that it's growing and the interest that people are showing for it. This is where real change can happen along with all the good work that you're doing in your community. And when we put all of these pieces together, uh, Ohio comes out right at the top of getting things done and being a leader in the world of prevention and uh, the reduction of substance use. So thank you for what you do and have a wonderful week. Thank you, everyone. Just as a reminder, um, you will get your follow-up emails containing your certificates for participation today and um, roughly three hours after the call, and we will have this video up on YouTube by the end of the business day today. As always, thank you so much. Please send in your questions, your thoughts, and your suggestions. We are always eager to hear. Have a great day, everyone, and see you soon.